Thank you so much for coming today. Um, my name is Holly Gaborio, and um, we're actually putting this on with the RISD Museum through the Fold PVD, which is a curated pop-up event series. Um, love, love, love these ladies, and I am so proud of what they're able to do with this house, Dirt Palace, and the Wedding Cake House. I'm gonna pass it immediately off to Kate, who's gonna do some introductions, and then afterwards, I welcome everyone to join us for a brief reception outside. Enjoy. Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome on a Sunday morning. It's good to see so many, uh, so many friendly faces here. Um, welcome to the RISD Museum. I'm Kate Irvin, curator of costume and textiles here. Um, and I'm also curator of the exhibition Repair and Design Futures, which is up just through the end of this month. So if you haven't been there, please um, make a point of going to the other side of the museum and um, spending some time in that show because we do really see a connection between this program and the work. Um, that, that we'll be hearing about and the exhibition. Um, so it's my true pleasure to introduce um, this program, Ruffles Repair and Ritual, the Fine Art of Fixing, that was organized um, so adroitly um, by Holly Gaborio, uh, who's disappeared now, but um, her, <laughs> her efforts are much, much appreciated, um, and featuring Xander Morrow and Pippi Zornosa, co-directors of the Dirt Palace at the Wedding Cake House, in conversation with Taylor. Politis. Um, I'm just going to read you their uh, introductions briefly, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of um, history as to why we're doing this program here. What's the connection? I suspect that many of you know this, but um, but but uh, we'll go into a little bit more detail. Um, Pippi Zornosa is an interdisciplinary artist working in sound, performance, installation, video, and printmaking, and is a co-founder of the Dirt Palace Feminist Art Collective in Providence, Rhode Island. Formed in 2000, the Dirt Palace has since become um, has since come to embody the oxymoron of underground institution. Her work is housed in the collections of the Museum of Modern Art and the RISD Museum. And you will probably see her work on view, uh, you know, within months. Um, we we like to bring it out very often. <laughs> Um, Xander Morrow has been living the good life in the feminist sub-underground for too many years to count, as she wrote on her bony fingers. <laughs> um, she, uh, she draws pictures, she makes movies, produces plays with elaborate sets and costumes, and then makes stuff like posters, quilts, and dioramas. Her work is often about sp the spiritual relationships to the material stuff of this world. And she's the co-founder of the Dirt Palace um, in 2000. She currently serves as the vice chair of One Neighborhood Builders, a Providence Community Development Co Corporation, and is on Providence's Art and City Life Commission. And finally, Taylor Politis is a Rhode Island-based writer, educator, and researcher. His first novel, The Rebel Life, was published by Simon & Schuster, and his work is featured in anthologies as well as arts and news publications. He's a partner with Anne Hood and Hester Kaplan in Goat Hill, a collaboration dedicated to bringing writers and writing professionals to southern New England, and he works with local organizations to cultivate storytelling and community. So I can't believe, actually, that this, uh, that this moment is here. Um, we're at the tail end of the Repair and Design Futures exhibition. As I said, it closes at the end of this month um, and has been running for the full academic year. Um, but we're at the beginning of the public phase of the Dirt Palace at the Wedding Cake House. Um, it was less than two years ago that Xander and Pippi met with us at the museum and talked about their project in what they called a long shot proposal to the Warhol Foundation. Um, and as they put it, to, to commission a bunch of um, local and or Dirt Palace affiliated artists to make works inspired by the house and its history for installation at the house. So this was less than two years ago. I looked at the date of the email, it was in August of 2017. <laughs> 
Um, and and at that point, you know, we were we, I was in the planning phases, deep in the planning phases of um, the repair and design futures exhibition. So we of course were really were you know making an effort to tie the two together, and it made perfect sense. Um, and so and here we are talking about um, the 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 ambitious restoration project um, of this iconic house at um, 514 Broadway Street on the west side. And this was less than two years ago. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, before we get them on stage and we really get to hear the kind of like the juicy details of this restoration, um, if I may, I'd love to quickly outline the RISD Museum's connection to the Wedding Cake House, um, or what I've always called the Cherokee House, um, a grand residence dripping with decorative details inside and out, um, the rooms uh, of which for decades of its history were filled with textiles, garments, business records, and client correspondence for the dressmaking atelier run by sisters Laura and Anna Taroki from 1915 to 1947. A veritable time capsule, this archive was meticulously wrapped up by Laura Taroki Chella um, upon the death of her older sister, Anna, in 1947, and stored untouched in the house's upper floor showroom and sewing rooms until 1990. As a curator of costume and textiles, I'm privileged to have become quite familiar with the more than 300 fabrics, trims, and garments that ended up in the RISD Museum's collections. Um, there are many more hundreds that ended up in the collections of the University of Rhode Island. Um, this treasure trove of primarily 1920s and 1930s textiles and garments in various states of production glisten with metallic lame yarns, dazzle with beads and sequins of all shapes, sizes, and colors, and dance with jazz age designs that truly tickle the imagination. But as wonderful as these pieces are, kind of in the, with their sparkle and shine, I think it's really important to honor and recognize um, the, or it's important to honor and recognize the value and intricacies and complexities of the textiles saved by Anna and Laura over the years of their business. Um, but it's likewise instructive to highlight the irregularities and the misfits, quite literally, of the garments wrapped and tucked away by, for posterity by Laura. Through 1924, over half of the Cherokee's business encompassed altering, repairing, and freshening up garments for their elite clientele. Given this aspect of their business and my firsthand observation that many of the garments now in the collections of the RISD Museum either show abnormalities in their construction or they're just simply unfinished, this archive exists because of these faults. In other words, there would not be as many material stories to tell if every fabric and fashion were sold, every garment was finished, every customer was satisfied and paid up. Humanity and human relations live in the imperfect and unfinished garments more than they do in the unworn and impeccable Raymond. Respect for history and materials, even those left behind by, by fashion or languishing unfinished, is reflected in the archive that was so carefully packaged and saved by Laura in honor of her, old, of her older sister's life work. Maintenance and care for family, which included the seamstresses who were working on the top floor of the house, allowed for the survival of this remarkable and rare archive. And it in turn inspires the current reconstructions and interpretations of the narrative that we're soon going to hear all about. When the Cella family sold the house where they had lived and their family had worked for decades, it really literally sagged with the loss of emotional investment. But the beads, sequins, and the threads have remained in the cracks, and a new family of artists have come to reanimate its rooms and halls. A new era of artisanry, labor, and craft has dawned in the house. Repair here is a long, slow process of visually puzzling together and re-envisioning a house and its many narratives with thought, creativity, and imagination. By resurrecting the Taroki sisters' material investment through the ambitious ruffles ritual and repair project and its emphasis on the reparative intimacy of handcraft, Xander Pippi and their core of artists, friends, and supporters are respectfully breathing new life into the cracks of a house, its histories, and its cultures. So with that said, I would love to invite you to the stage so we can kind of see beautiful images and hear your, uh, your stories.
Uh, thank you so much, Kate, for that fabulous introduction, and uh, thank you to Holly and uh, The Fold for organizing this event, and everyone at the RISD Museum, Deb Clemens particularly, in, in helping make this happen as well. And thank you all uh, for being here. I'm really thrilled uh, being a fan of history and of uh, the life of this city in the past. I um, <laughs> used to see the wedding cake house uh, in its sort of glorious dereliction uh, and wonder what would happen to it. So it's a real honor, as Kate noted, to think of you know the short time that's passed uh, between that terrible dereliction and the glorious sort of rebirth of this house that we're seeing today. Um, and so I'm really thrilled and honored to be able to be here and, and talk with, with you guys about it. Um, and, but before we get started, I wanted to just sort of do a little poll of the audience. How many people have been inside the wedding cake house at any time? Oh, wow, so good, a lot of people. How many people have heard about it uh, maybe know where the house is, but uh, don't, don't necessarily know or understand what's going on there, or interested. All right, so good, a few people who kind of want to know. Um, and so Kate gave a great background on the, the house, the um, history of the house, the Cherokee sisters, this couture establishment that, that was in there. Um, but I would love to ask uh, Pippi and Xander, uh, as we begin, what, um, what maybe would you say about the story of the Wedding Cake House that is most relevant to you or sort of tells the story of the house and what you're doing in it? Is that, is that a wow, total? Wow, that's really not in the questions we originally talked we about. <laughs> questions. I, I changed them all. I changed them all. Um, well, I think what's most important about the house is, and I think this is not just personally between the two of us, is how much it's lived in so many people in the city's imagination. And um, it has been abandoned for so long. I'm, I mean, we, we're not quite sure. There was another family who lived in there for a short period of time, but we were thinking almost 30 years. And both Sandra and I have memories of um, seeing the house in the late 90s, early 2000s, and it just already looked like it was falling into disrepair. And um, the Providence Preservation Society calls it the consummate gingerbread. So, I mean, it's just the exterior of it has so much detail and ornamentation and is really fantastical. Um, and I think what I always remember is that, you know, we have another um, location, the Dirt Palace Classic, as we call it. And that building used to have really have a very um, worn down exterior, even though the interior was very lively and had a lot of artist works in it. And I always used to think like, no one knows from the outside of this building what the inside is like. And I remember going by the wedding cake house and always being like, that's what the dirt palace looks like in my mind, <laughs> which is just crazy that now, I mean, I would have no, you know, that's, it's just a crazy <laughs> connection. Um, but I don't know. I love that. True, right? You, like everyone in the city, have passed by this monument, really, and seen it crumbling, and that it, it sort of sparked your imagination as well. What are you, what is the plan with the house? The work is, is very close to done inside. What will the house be now? Yeah, so um, maybe I'll use this minute to kind of back up and answer a little bit more of the first question, and, um, and then jump into like the program idea. So we kind of, ca we came to the house from a moment of thinking about our organization, the Dirt Palace, which is a feminist art space, um, being at kind of a pivotal moment where it had done a lot of the things it had set out to do and we had to really decide what was next. Um, and we were lucky to have support from the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation. We did a strategic plan. We did a lot of like thinking hard. We visited a lot of other really inspiring spaces that were, um, you know, had some kind of kinship or had some kind of similarity, whether they were feminist or um, in second cities or, um, uh, you know, had a front window gallery. So we had, we had been really gestating and thinking about like what we were interested in doing. And um, one of the things was that the artists that we really had been working with were fairly young. Um, it was a, we were interested in thinking about how to diversify across a lot of planes, how to support artists at different moments in their careers. And so we had this sense that, and so from doing a strategic plan, we were told your, you know, your core, the things you're really good at are community development, 
property management, project management. Why don't you think about doing another facility? It turns out there's money for facilities in Rhode Island. This might be the way to really stabilize. And so we had this idea we were going to do another um, project, and we started to talk to people. We talked to our city council person who put us in touch with the city's real estate person, and he was like, what about this house? And we were like, no way, you're crazy. What kind of suckers do you think we are? But we want to see the inside of that place like everybody in Providence. Like, let's go for a tour. Sure, we'll pretend that we might renovate that somehow. And then, um, you know, we saw it and we kind of reflected on the history. And we got to thinking about, um, you know, the idea of doing kind of a more um, traditional residency that's more short term as a way of supporting more mid-career artists and thinking about being able to connect to the public by having this earned income bed and breakfast component. So that's the basic model. There, um, The second floor will basically be bed and breakfast suites. The idea is to kind of um, interest people who are interested in traveling but want to support and meet artists along the way. Um, the third floor will be uh, residency, short-term residencies for artists who are working on a specific project with the ability to um, use the facilities that already exist at the Dirt Palace. Am I leaving anything out? Yeah. Oh, no, I don't mean like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, the two things that I was thinking when you were talking is part of the reason that we were doing this strategic plan, it was that the Dirt Palace facility was never able to um, support any paid positions. It was... Uh, there's a lot of programming and things that happen there, but it was all labor of love. And so part of our need to grow was to actually make it sustainable so that it could be the work that we do in the world rather than working for other organizations. Um, and then the second thing I was thinking when you were talking was that, um, uh, oh, I already forgot. So look at that. <laughs> well, and the Dirt Palace, too, yeah. uh, if there are people who don't know, the Dirt Palace is a, a building in Olneyville that offers residency to artists, to young, developing artists? What's the focus there? How does so, that work? And part of that is just the, the logistics of the space. It's a one shared living situation. So there's five to seven artists there at any given time who all live together on, I mean, it's a very uh, large space. And then, um, and then that they live on the second floor and on the first floor there's all different facilities. So there's a screen printing shop, a uh, letterpress, a place to build sculpture, wood shop, and um, and I just think that people who, I mean, there's a lot of, there's very few times I think maybe in people's lives where maybe group living situations make sense. That was a weird way of saying it, but <laughs> but that like that that really limited who we could work with. And I think the other idea was that um, you know Rhode Island has such a wealth of resources for. Um, emerging younger artists. And as we were getting older, we were thinking about the field and what opportunities were there for mid-career to later career artists. Um, and something that is in more of a time span, span, two weeks to do a residency is like more of what could be realistic with people taking off work and those sort of life constraints with family. Um, so, uh, that was a lot of how we built our programming, but also this idea of like how can we connect audiences to artists, and this idea of artists all working usually is siloed, and that this idea that we basically have this built-in audience through our programming through the B&B, &B, and that um, those people can be talking to living, working artists while they're in process, and our programming on the first floor will connect those travelers, and also people locally who can come to the events with the working artists, yeah. So amazing, and visionary. The idea too that over the Dirt Palace started around 2000, so for the past 20 years, offering residencies to artists, and this, the, the way this has evolved is sort of a next phase, a sustainable, a sort of economically viable program that funds itself and supports artists as well. And so that, this is a question that I, I told you I was gonna ask. What is, the, what is the wedding cake house? What does all of the work that you do mean to you in an emotional sense? What is the sort of the spiritual feeding you get out of doing a project like this? You don't have your answer prepared? <laughs> the answer's not prepared. I mean, honestly, just being able to work with other artists as something that we can do in our day-to-day -day work life, I mean, to me, that's a constant inspiration being around all the artists who worked in the show and just seeing the work that they did was 
so inspiring to my own work and really also helped me, you know, we, I think we were both working so much on construction and project management at that time, but seeing other people's process and work that they were making was still helping me question like where I was coming from and my work. And I just think that connection to other artists is super meaningful for both of us. I mean, when we started the Dirt Palace, it was um, kind of very intentionally understanding that we want to live lives that are close to other artists, asking questions, experimenting, um, thinking about identity as it relates to art, about power, about um, cultural change. And so I think this is kind of like the next push forward, you know, and it, um, and, um, I can't think of anything more meaningful. And I think that was also a thing as we went and um, kind of studied other spaces that were doing these things as we were doing research, being like, okay, this is kind of the only way I can imagine living is you know, getting to share a life with other people who are creating things or questioning things are um, you know, taking space to kind of build places where you can nest in and ferment ideas that are um, gonna push push outwards at the edges of culture. So. Great, and, and I think that Kate in her introduction also talked about both of you as individual artists. So this is the, que this is the question, I am gonna ask the question. Um, I, I had uh, discussed with them asking, what was the first thing you made as a child? What was that sort of spark of the young artist in you that you remember as sort of a pivotal moment? I was gonna ask, as, as children, did you engage in historic home renovations? Um, <laughs> and maybe that's, maybe that's the right question to ask. <laughs> well, one of my first art projects, my first kind of conceptual yeah. art project as a child was sort of like, you know, space building, which was called, I would play movie theater but basically sit on a cinder block underneath a pine tree by myself and stare out into space. <laughs> you were imagining yourself yeah. inside the theater. <laughs> and like eat peanuts or something. Screening, you know? what were you screening? Like, Xander was a much more creative child than I was. I, so, like the stories are like, I love to play No Electricity Day. No, that's and, true, yeah. that's true. That yeah. was the other thing I liked to do as a child. Yeah. yeah. I actually think that I was really lucky in the sense that I, um, when I was younger, I could draw really realistically, which I think is what people think of in relation to technical proficiency of an artist. So I was encouraged to make art just from that. And I feel like in some ways that's really sad because there's so many people who are probably way more creative than I am. But like, but no, but I just mean in the sense that like technical proficiency and being able to draw a realistic per portrait of a person is not necessarily like what it means or like the most um, profound thing about being an artist. And so I think that I just happened to have that skill and so I was pushed in that way or just told that I was an artist because I had that. And, um, and now as an adult, I'm always like, why can't I loosen up? Just be more, you know, like. My drawing's too perfect. <laughs> well, but, you know, like, the, the think of things that have a lot of emotion and um, resonance, and a lot of times there's, like, can be, like, a messy or sloppy character, and those are, like, the artists that I love the most, so, you know. I and know. I would say, I mean, doing just, uh, I, I've known you guys for, for several years now, and I, I know you through the house project in, in the primary way, and, and yet I, I know and see glimpses of you as artists as well in a lot of in, in the things that you're doing in the house, but also as research, I wanted to do a little digging as well. So I would say the idea of creativity, um, one of the great videos that I love coming across was Rectrix, where Pippi is on a table in a white dress being buried alive, a sort of simulated <laughs> living burial with music around. What, and so to go from that child sort of imagining the work or, or sort of playing in the work to the artist you think of yourself as today, what would you say the meaning or the, the um, drive, the, uh, the motivation behind the work you make today is? How would you explain that for both of you? Wow. Um, <laughs> that was not on the list. That yeah, was not just the definitely list. not on the list. <laughs> um, I think that, um, that specific work that you're speaking of, a lot of that to me had to do with personal grieving. 
um, not just like the grieving of loss of loved ones, but also just like grieving power structures that exist in the world. And, um, and I think that specific performance project has a lot of anger and sadness. So specifically that work um, is drawing from a lot of that content. Yeah. And, and I think anger, obviously, frustration, looking at the world and being angry can drive a creative process. What about you, Xander? How do you sort of think about your work and the, the, the meaning or the motivation behind it? Yeah. Um, I don't want to echo Pippi and be like, yeah, grief and anger. Yep, that's <laughs> it. That's all there is. Yeah. Pretty big one, though. It's a big one. It's a big one. <laughs> but um, yeah, those things come in too. And I think if it was going to be something else, I think there's part of me that's. Um, Inter very interested in material and m thinking about objects and material culture, and but also just on a bigger picture about resources and kind of management and arranging things and kind of reallocating resources and kind of, you know, the process of working with things that have already existed in one way as kind of a metaphor or a way of thinking through ways. I mean, obviously, right, our culture has an issue with like uh, us being very skewed in terms of how resources are allocated. And so thinking through like what is the potential for artists and creativity in like reallocating things in ways that are more just or more interesting or how does creativity factor into thinking about like moving pieces around and kind of reorganizing culture. If I can something. push a little bit the um, grief and anger about what? Uh, oh, I mean, I think did I already say this? Say it again. Okay. Say it again. Even if you I think just under living within systems that are not just. I think right. you know, and and how that hurts everyone, not just the people who are oppressed, but also people in power, and just are the framework that the world is, you know, dominantly constructed in, um, like pushing against that framework. Right. I guess. And that's what the Dirt Palace was an opportunity to give voice for you as artists, but for all the people who come through that space. That's, I guess that's too what I'm getting at. The artwork, the, the artists that you're supporting, the intention too is to open up that opportunity to people, to pe un whatever the, the sort of, the, the way we talk about these things, underrepresented people, or people who have been outside of that, that pool of resources. This is a, a focal point of, of your work, and, and why is that important? Um, I th on a most basic level, I think, you know, um, human rights are important, equity is important. I think I care a lot about beauty and there's a lot of beauty loss based on um, people not being able to access things or different voices not being able to kind of be heard or, sh or to, to shine. Um, I think that, you know, when things are allocated in a way that aren't, don't feel just, there's always a loss to culture for what kind of could be heard by voices that are, you know, kind of like kept at the margins could right. be saying. And so I, I think, um, yeah, figuring out a way or a mechanism to kind of experiment with like there just being more, more potential for more voices in the mix and letting that. We're maximal, yeah. maximalists. Maximalist. More, <laughs> always more. <laughs> do you, um, how did you guys meet? Where did you first intersect? Um, we basically met starting the Dirt Palace, which is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> because, um, I mean, I was so naive at the time anyway that I was like, I love all these people. I'm going to live my life with them forever. Um, <laughs> And then that kind of became true with, you know, with Xander specifically. Yes. Um, but I mean, we really knew each other very tangentially, um, and we met through finding the Dirt Palace classic building. Yeah, and so which is the old library in Olneyville. Yeah, right. And how did that come about? Why? What was it that brought you together to create the Dirt Palace? And why, it, why at that particular moment in your lives was that something that you, you thought was important to do? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting to see how much the world has even changed in the past 19 years, or almost 20. Um,
but at the time, you know, so much, especially as a young person, so much culture was happening within kind of music and music underground spaces, and they were so incredibly male-dominated that having a role was either like as girlfriend or fan, or it just seemed pathetic to me. Like it was just un um, consciousable, you know, and I was like, this is not a world I want to live in. And I think we all had our own reasons. And I think there was just, um, but I think all of us were ready to see change in a very tangible way and um, experiment with what it means when women get together and try to amplify. There's so many voices telling particularly young women to kind of take, to, to follow paths in very part particular ways. And so the question was, what if we amplify the voices in our own heads and each other's heads that say, focus on your creativity, focus on your artistic practice, and follow that. So, yeah. yeah. And it was very much an experiment. I think that's something that we often talk about is that it was left very open-ended <laughs> in the sense of what the project even could be or where it was going. And even within um, the structure of Dirt Palace now, we have built in mechanisms to, where we basically have this one all day meeting where we think about um, what's working, what isn't, how do we want to change, and so that we build change into the dialogue with each other because, you know, I, I think being flexible and, and responding to when things are working or not working and rather than, you know, following the status quo has been really helpful and I think it's not something that like, my brain really actually does very well. Like I feel like I can get really in the day-to-day -day grind, but like having it built into how we connect with each other there has been extremely helpful. Yeah, that's great. And and so what in that process of creating the Dirt Palace or or this sort of in the process of putting together this experiment that ends up having longevity to it? What was a moment where you were ready to walk away? What was the hardest? aspect of, of that process in those early days of, of creating and stabilizing this, this group? Um, I think the early days were definitely the hardest. Um, when we first got there, there was no heat. I mean, like just on a like pure basic survival level, we were camped out downstairs. There were windows on all of the, there were boards on all of the windows. I worked at a film lab where I was sitting in the dark all day, so I was like, seeing literally like 15 <laughs> minutes of sunlight. I was like, I'm going to develop sonar. Um, this is like a, like it was, you know, they're on like, ev and everyone had their own stories of the ways that they were just like maxed out and, um, you know, really not sure anything could work or even if anyone cared or anything mattered. And um, so it's funny because it's just like, and everything since that like first year has kind of been like downhill. Like it was just like, we had a refrigerator, but you didn't need to put your vegetables away because the it kitchen was, so was that cold. It was so like it was, like I know it sounds like I'm We like, brought the dishes somewhere else oh, yeah. to get washed. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe everyone else did that and maybe that's why everyone hated me at the time because I didn't actually do the dishes. I was young. How about you, do you have a, a sort of like uh, dark night of the soul story with the Dirt Palace? Not really. I mean, we did talk about earlier that in some ways this project was that moment because um, Dirt Palace was such an um, important part of our what we were doing, but really it wasn't sustainable and making the decision to actually do another project that was sustaining, going to sustain everything financially, I think was was the moment where we were like, we either need to grow or maybe this can't work anymore. And that, that was a lot, of, I mean, it was many years of, uh, <clears throat> yeah, working and wanting to make a decision, like is this gonna be the work that we do or are we gonna continue to work in other careers, other trajectories, other paths as our like day job? Yeah. And you talked about the Rauschenberg Foundation and working with them on a strategic plan, having, having outside people artists, people who are in the sort of the art, art making community come in and give you maybe a guide or, or, or some, some navigation. How did you come to that decision together to say, to say this process is doable and we're gonna do it? Which to me on the outside, like you said, going through the house sort of pretending, oh yeah, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna do this. It just <laughs> seems like staggeringly overwhelming. Yeah, I think we, after we saw the house, we were like, there's no way. 
<laughs> yeah. L literally, the budget, we just was like, what, the budget actually that um, Clark from the revolving fund sort of threw out as what he thought it would cost <laughs> is actually low. But even hearing those numbers at the time, yeah, we, were like, no we were like, I mean, it was, I can't even tell you like more than 10 times more than the uh, original like renovation we did at Derp House to make it legal. So it was just, it felt like an impossible task. But um, so we kind of, we were walking away and we were trying to think of where else we were going. And um, there was a cultural facility grant, um, which is something that the voters voted on. It was a bond um, and it was administrated by the Rhode Island State Council of the Arts. And we knew we were gonna put in an application for um, a project and we thought it would probably be something for the Dirt Palace. And then I think we went to like a public meeting and everyone was crazy and we were like, go big or go home, we're gonna write this grant. <laughs> it's know? true, we were at a neighborhood meeting and everyone was being so bonkers, just like talking about parking when that was not the issue. And I was like, we are at least have it together as all these people who are like community leaders and we can totally <laughs> like do a bigger project. And I think the idea was like, let's just submit this grant, see what happens, yeah. which was kind of the way a couple things have happened where we're like, if it happens, it could be, I trouble. guess that's trouble, this is what we're doing, but if we don't get the grant, then yeah. maybe it's the, for the best. So we just sort of threw our hat into the ring. Yeah. And we are really, really fortunate that people from RISCA could see our vision and just, um, and they've Liz been so Keith supportive. Here yeah. who, was, who helped you a lot with that? Yes, yeah. yes, Liz has been amazing, yeah. Um, following up on that a tiny bit is that it was also, we were doing a site visit in New York with um, Lauren Rosati, who's a Rhode Island native, but had been working at Exit Art and had written the book about kind of Exit Art and that um, was really inspiring to kind of see this other to kind of be right in the mix of talking to someone who was kind of a historian of this really influential, amazing art space and who had lived these lives and kind of being like, no, this is really what we want to be doing if we can, just, yeah. yeah. And what, and quickly, the um, as we're sort of heading into time, what, what was the one thing you learned through the Dirt Palace process that was most useful in the Wedding Cake House uh, renovation? Water is the enemy. <laughs> this is a good, this, this is, is like a, the larger leaking story. Roofs. I know, it's like not a profound answer, but it's true. It's the most, the the most, most destructive, important truths are the most profound. destructive force is water. Yeah. Um, I don't know, do you? What about, no worries, no worries. So, and, and to, to come back to the, the show, the, the Repair and Design Futures, to uh, Ruffles Repair and Ritual, this idea of repair, and I love that you were talking about going to a community meeting where everyone is focused on the parking, how terrible the parking situation is. To be clear, that's not what the meeting was about, right. and that's why it was well, we're gonna, just for, to sort of, right, the, the, strike that from the record. Um, <laughs> but what is, what is your vision of what is wrong that you are repairing? Big question, and I think we sort of talked on it. And I do want to jump in and say Kate was really modest and kind of talking about the the show that she had in mind, and um, and then our show. We were totally, you know, um, when when Kate had kind of shared what her big project was and what she was doing, we were like, you are tapping into like what needs to be addressed at this moment in thinking about art, and this is. And if like if you're cool with it, we'd love to do a show that is riffing off of that, and that's like um, connected because it feels like this is at the core of like what it means that what I think people should, but what I think artists need to be thinking about. There's, and it's sad because it feels like it should be what every sector of society is thinking about, but it feels like artists are the ones who are coming to the table to have these conversations about how is our culture broken and what do we do to repair that. Um, and I think it's... How is our culture broken and what do we do to repair that? Um, you know, eight million years of injustice, uh, America, genocide, <laughs> all these things, you know, we, I think we all know them um, and know that, um, that it's a process that involves looking deep and thinking about what it means to live in a society together where we're really sharing um, our existence and uh, our lives, so... I guess we didn't really talk about the exhibition at all um, in this context. This is a good time, yeah. Yeah, maybe just to say, so part of us 
renovating um, the White and Cake House is we received funding from the Warhol Foundation to do an exhibition that is uh, 150 artists works to celebrate the 150 anniversary of when the house was built. And um, uh, 50 of those works are things, artist commissions that are built long term into the house. So artists made tile, wallpaper, um, the sign outside, um, windows. Um, so actually having artists build directly into the house and um, and then there's 50 works that are on the walls. Um, so art that you can look at that's in frames and then 25 works um, were literary research which Taylor and Mary Kim Arnold um, curated this and helped with us book publication that we've put out and then 25 works are, will be performance, time-based video works that we have um, programming uh, over the course of the summer that people can see. So, um, yeah. And I, and so I think, right, the idea of, of the artist, the place of the artist is, is, is to draw attention to these things that are broken, to say, to point at and name the things that are broken. And, but also what you guys are doing with this project, which is extraordinary to me, and which I'm a ben beneficiary of by being invited to participate, is, is, create, is knitting together community as well through this house. And I think of those 150 artists. I think of all the people who volunteered and came and helped haul debris or paint or put up wallpaper. All of these people suddenly have a stake in this house, and that's extraordinary to me that what you have done at the Dirt Palace and what you have, have made of the Wedding Cake House is about knitting together community, repairing community as well. And so the last thing I would ask, which you don't have to answer, is how do you see, you, you mentioned about the changes in Providence or, or in the world in the past 20 years. I'm interested too in the changes in Providence and how you see this work as filling a need or preserving an important part of the culture of the city. I can say in a very straightforward yeah. way yeah, um, is just I think that so many people have been in love with this house and honestly just having programming in there that makes it so people can access it. I know that's like pretty boring answer to that question, but this Great idea answer. that yeah. it's not, the house A um, doesn't get torn down, but B, it doesn't become one person's mansion or a few people's condos that it's gonna be a space now that a lot of people can go inside and access. And I think when we um, were dealing with the show, what you were saying about all these artists now having a stake, that wasn't a conscious, like, oh, now all these people can have a stake in this. But when we did have the opening just recently, realizing how invested everyone was because they had worked on the house and all worked together, I mean, that realizing how meaningful that was to people was, I it just I had, didn't hadn't anticipated it. I guess, right. yeah. I think that's wonderful too. That that instinct of, I mean, the necessity of bringing people in to help you accomplish this, um, but the openness of that as well. Um, this unexpected but really maybe most important product is creating this this tightly knit community through this this structure and people's participation in the structure. It makes me think of like building barns, people, everyone in the town coming out and building a barn together, and that this is a sort of a sacred space for art making, for truth speaking, and for culture in the city. And so a wonderful, um, a wonderful work that you, you both have done. Thank you. And, and we'll, yeah, I think that deserves it. And I think we have uh, a couple minutes for questions. If there are people in the audience who have questions, we're gonna move quickly to the, um, to the, the uh, snack portion, but <laughs> if there are questions before. And I have a microphone, so I yeah. will. I'm in platforms, give me two seconds Wait, and I'll be right there. How many, so. oh, I wanted to ask too, how many people in the room ha did participate, either in the work days or in creating an artwork? How many people? Yeah, a show of hands. So a lot of that community is here today as well. Any questions? Yeah, Secrets yeah, exposed? Yeah, you. Are you pointing to me? Yes, I am. I'm coming right over to you. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> the 
Okay, my question is, is the wedding cake house, like the name wedding cake, is that something you guys thought of? Or is that like related to the women who owned the house originally? I think it was just something colloquially, I can never say that word, um, that is how people refer to it. And um, so we just sort of, it was the easiest way that people had already been calling it that, whereas like, I feel like we've talked to several preservationists who are like, it's the Kendrick Prentice Toroki house. <laughs> or someone else would be like, well, I call it the Prentice house. So, but I think that was less, um, that was really something that people who are preservation minded and history minded would know more. Um, so it just already was what people had been calling the house, yeah. Hi, I just want to congratulate you on transforming this house. I had the opportunity to go through it, and it's a fantastic place to, to visit. Um, I had a lot of questions, but one of the questions I had was uh, for each of the artists that, you said 25 artists that uh, redid actual spaces, were they given grants from different organizations and, uh, or the whatever primary one was? And then I wondered, uh, the <clears throat> since it's a historic house, I mean, outside anyway, <clears throat> excuse me, are you um, obligated to keep the historical uh, exterior but can do anything you want inside? I just wondered what all of those restrictions and how you're dealing with it. Yep. Um, so to answer your first question, um, it's 50 artists who have built stuff into the space, and all of the artists in um, the whole exhibit received stipends for their work. The artists who did um, specific things had budgets that they were working with that then they could kind of propose, like within that budget, I can do this. Um, so that's how that logistically worked out. And, um, and we had an amazing um, assistant last summer who helped us write contracts with all of the artists that really spelled everything out, because it's important to us to feel like there's transparency and everyone knows what they're getting into and that it's a well-designed project and people are set up to succeed because they have the resources they need. So that felt really important to us. And um, it's also really important for us to pay artists. Yeah. 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 Um, and so um, in terms of historic preservation stuff, yes, to the outside of the house, we do have a clause that, um, that, that no preservation body has. Um, control over the sculpture that we put in, and that was something that was on the grounds, and that was something that was really important to us to not, given like some of the censorship we've seen that, you know, that um, that is not um, kind of come under the domain of any other body. It's important to us that as arts administrators, that if we put in a piece of art that nobody else can say like, oh, I don't like this because it, you know, talks about this issue that's too sensitive for the neighborhood or something that, um, um, and then um, in terms of the interior and the say that historic preservation has over it, it's a negotiation. I'm just gonna be as politic as possible. <laughs> we, we do have to um, follow preservation guidelines on the inside of the house because yeah. we're dealing with state historic tax credits. So, and you're in a historic yeah. district? The house is in, is it part of the Broadway historic district? Yes, it is. So yeah. it's sort of, right, regulated yeah. by that. But I, I mean, it, to put in my two cents, I think that the sensitivity and care that you both have taken ex, in, in the exterior and the interior in returning the house to something like its historic aspect is really extraordinary as well. We have a question, right, question over here. here. Reach up to the roof when the ladder's not tall enough. Right. How do you get up to all those high corners? They're very high. Oh, and the, on the, well, on the inside, we definitely have ladders that are tall enough, but the outside, the painters had to get a lift in. Cherry, like and, yeah, picker. basically a cherry picker to get all the way to the top of the tower. And that thing is really heavy, and I would have to say that it made crazy divots in our lot. But yeah, they used basically like a crane to get up to the very top. Yeah. We have time for just one more yeah. question. I'm looking right over here. And, and if you have questions, we'll, we'll be hanging out in the snack area, and you can definitely take uh, a minute ask and talk then. Snack time. <laughs> hey, I was just wondering when the residency launches and when the bed and breakfast launches, what the timeline for that is. Yeah. 
So, so much of this stuff is sort of out of our control. We're beginning the process of working with inspectors to get our certificate of occupancy, but we've done this enough to know that so many things can kind of come up between then and now, um, or they can bring things up that take more time and take more money. It's really normal for timelines to get extended through that process. Um, we have another kind of um, event, uh, September 14th, um, that we're hoping will be kind of, will be through all those hurdles, but it's possible that we, we won't. Um, and we have a kind of soft launch. We have our first residents coming in August, kind of like as a test case, who are um, these three women from Montreal who live different places now who are like making a TV show pilot and gonna be doing that project there, yeah. So mark your calendar, September 14th, for the big uh, big party. Grand opening. All right, and thank you all. We'll can go to, uh, yeah. I just want to mention one thing. Can you mention when the house is open to the public? You were mentioning on Saturdays, yeah. possibly. I didn't know if that's something. Yeah, so at least for um, June, we have to kind of like regroup every once in a while just to figure out how things mesh with our construction timelines. But um, for June, if anyone wants to come and peek in at the show, um, we very informally have just have the doors open on Saturday afternoons from 1.30 to 3.30. So pop by if you're interested. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thank you all.